Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our presentation, Poetry, the Language of Longing. Um, you should find on your chairs a card um, about a journal called Presence, which is a journal of Catholic poetry. And I want to thank Marianne Miller and all the people of Presence for sponsoring, helping to sponsor this event. So tonight's, yes. <laughs> So tonight, um, our distinguished guest, Paul Mariani, is going to speak about poetry and read a few poems, and then we're going to announce the winners of our 2019 New York Encounter Poetry Contest. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief biography about Mr. Mariani. He is a poet, author of many books, and the University Professor of English Emeritus at Boston College. And he has too many achievements to even name, but I would like to name just one, and that is that this September, uh, he will be awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Catholic Imagination Conference at Loyola, Loyola University in Chicago. So we're really extremely blessed and privileged to have with us this evening Paul Mariani. Thank you very much, Rita. Something to start from. I hope. Let me begin this evening by quoting from the Austrian Catholic philosopher, Joseph Seifert, who heads up the John Paul II Academy for Human Life and Family. Authentic hope, he reminds us, begins with our power to realize what is good. Hope, therefore, must be reasonable to be desirable and it must be directed to the other on whom the realization of our aspirations depends. The better and more perfect the person in whom we put our hope, and the mightier he or she is, the more rational is our hope. Hope can only meaningfully be directed to a person and to a completely trustworthy person who can grant us what we hope for. Hope to make sense presupposes a good and loving God. Placing all our hope in human ingenuity, goodwill, and power is ultimately illusory. There are two lights. St. Bonifacio tells us. If you once have seen the world in the light of the sun, you will also see much more of it in the far weaker light of the moon and the stars at night. Just so. Once reality has been illumined by divine revelation, you will also see much more of it by human reason. As St. John Paul put it, if we love, we cannot hope for the good of our beloved less than for our own. Hope is wholly permeated by love and extends to the other's happiness as well. Father Michael Casey, a Cistercian monk of the Tarawara Abbey in Australia, has this to say about our encounter with the divine. Jesus, he reminds us, did promise us something to start from. That the Father, our Father, was willing to risk everything to bring us home and has already done so many times. It is in God's tender care for every one of us 
for every family and community that we invest our hope for the future. And so we take comfort. Our distinctive, unique, inner inexperience, God's instressing, to use Hopkins' word, himself upon us, would seem to come first in the ladder of hope. The sacred word would be the second step of revelation offered as an explanation that keeps on giving what God has given us. And then there's poetry, which can give us something to start from. Here are just a few of many examples. First, from other poets, and then some words in which I try to express my own sense of hope as a poet for whom the Catholic faith, even when I myself fell short, has always been paramount. And the first poem I'd like to read is by my neighbor, Emily Dickinson, up there in Amherst. <laughs> it's called Hope. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. The second one is from Mary Oliver, who just passed very recently. It's called Wild Geese. <clears throat> you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles to the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. The third example is by Marie Howe. It's called the Stone Market. The people Jesus loved were shopping at the Star Market yesterday. An old, lead-colored man standing next to me at the checkout breathed so heavily I had to step back a few steps. Even after his bags were packed, he still stood, breathing hard and hawking into his hand. The feeble, the lame, I could hardly look at them. Shuffling through the aisles, they smelled of decay, as if the star market had declared a day off for the able-bodied, and I had wandered in with the rest of them. Sour milk, bad meat, looking for cereal and spring water. Jesus must have been a saint, I said to myself looking for my lost car in the parking lot later. 
stumbling among the people who would have been lowered into rooms by ropes, who would have crept out of caves or crawled from the corners of public baths on their hands and knees, begging for mercy. If I touch only the hem of his garment, one woman thought, could I bear the look on his face when he reels around? And then a poem by Leroy Jones or Amiri Baraka. It's called Preface to a 20 Volume Suicide Note. And it's for Kelly Jones, that's his daughter, who was born 16 May 1959. He's an angry man, but so gentle in this poem. He says, Lately, I've become accustomed by the way the ground opens up and envelops me each time I go out to walk the dog. Or the broad-edged silly music the wind makes when I run for a bus. Things have come to that. And now, each night, I count the stars, and each night, I get the same number. And when they will not come to be counted, I count the holes they leave. Nobody sings anymore. And then last night, I tiptoed up to my daughter's room and heard her talking to someone. And when I opened the door, there was no one there. Only she, on her knees, peeking into her own clasped hands. <coughs> I want to grab a little vodka. I'll be right there. <laughs> And the final poem by someone else is by my favorite, Gerard Manley Hopkins. It's one of the it's called Carrying and Comfort. We don't know the exact date. He just left it on a piece of paper and it was found after his death. Carrying and Comfort, 1885. Hopkins, Father Hopkins is about 40, 41 years old and he's stationed in Dublin at a time of uh, a great deal of uh, unrest because, uh, because of the Irish uh, conditions. And you're going to hear Jacob wrestling with the angel in this poem, and at the very end you're going to hear the Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, you're going to hear that. This is the poem, it's a sonnet. Not I will not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee, not unto a slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be, but ah, uh, but oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me thy ring world right foot rock? Lay a lion lid against me, scan with darks and devouring eyes my bruised bones and fan, oh, in turns of tempest, me, heat there, me, frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear? Nay, in all that toil, that coil since seems, I kiss the rod, hand rather, my heart low lap strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom though? The hero 
whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with my God. Oh, great. 
think they'll want to. September for my mother, on the memory of my mother. For Harriet Mariani, March 6, 1923, September the 16th, 1988. Mid-September, dear woman, and the monarch lights once more upon the purple panoply butterfly bush in the now decaying garden, as it has for the past 30 Septembers. And once again, like the softest breeze, I feel your gentle presence and lift my open hand toward it, toward you, hoping for a sign, me, your firstborn, who never seemed to have the time while you were with us still. My hand unfolds, the monarch hovering before it turns to float across the garden to another bush to settle there instead. And still I wait, wondering if it, if you, might rise from the distant purple and return here by my open, trembling hand and settle, if only for a moment, dear woman, before you lift and travel to some distant land, as monarchs will. How you love butterflies. So much so I had one etched on your gravestone when you left us that September, having given us all you had before the cancer took you, took you uh, too soon. Remember that final phone call your voice already tired when I said I'd be there. I said, I said, then driving north through the rain soaked night, getting lost and more lost as on we drove, then getting there too late. Stay now, mother, stay just a little longer before you're off again bound for some other place called home. <clears throat> the next one is for my The other is a little girl, age three or so, 
in a lavender two-piece bathing suit decked out with asterisk-like rose-pink purple stars, a little girl so full of life and whom he holds in both his arms tight against his chest as if he had the power to keep her from all harm. Somewhere he hopes a world much like the one his granddaughter has painted here exists. A world no one can ever tear from them. And if not that, oh, if not that, then at least a world where he can always hold her in his heart. suddenly the light broke through on a mountain and it was just like a transfiguration moment. It's called On the Way Home. There was a moment we were coming down from the turbulent waters of the Maline. It had been raining for what seemed hours on end. There was a thick mist hanging in the air, a billowing high above the larches and the pines so that the mountain peaks seemed all but hidden when suddenly Without warning, the face of one mountain far off to our left began to shine. It was as if some mystery had just revealed itself. The merest glimpse of what it was. I thought of Peter, bothering with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration to stay, stay. Or Moses, alone there on the mountain as the wind whispered in all but words. Here I am. Immerse yourself in me now. Now, for even this must pass, and you will descend, returning to a world which will or will not care. But know too that this moment may well return, and it will be as we hoped, and came together then forever. Okay, thank you. There's two more. Uh, this one is a little more comical. Uh, uh, it's called Hornet's Nest, and it's based on a, a job I was doing cleaning off the porch when I sprayed a hornet's nest, and you know what can happen. <laughs> hornet's nest. And it, it, uh, it has a, a little head note. Uh, I really feel I can touch you even in this darkness when I pray. These are the words of James Foley, who was executed uh, in 2014, and it's from his last message to his family. I really feel I can touch you even in this darkness when I pray. Recovered now enough to scrub the deck, which has turned dun brown with dirt and cobwebs in the months I twisted, hurting in one more hospital bed, my spinal wreck, my sick brain awash in static bubbles, instead of what I told myself were my tough, astringent thoughts. Oh Lord, the troubles I've seen. Well, get over that self-pity stuff. Your sweet wife has a job for you to do. So do it. <laughs> Soap and water, warm works best, a sponge, and a steady stream of water too, and voila, progress. Until you spray a hidden nest of hornets who come after you, each a fighter plane zigging this way and then that to catch you by surprise as first your left wrist and then your right erupt in pain. And now they've found your face, and now your eyes, 
and you make what the, what the books call a hasty retreat. <laughs> but damn it, this is your porch, your house, your home. And if these SOBs had just remained discreet, or better stayed hidden in their aerodrome, you might have done the live, let live. But no, not now. This is war. And one or the other will have to go. And so it's two cans of mustard gas and pow, right in the kisser, as Jackie Gleason used to say. Hello? And so I'm back again, ready for a fight. And I keep hitting them with all I've got. But they too hit back with all they have. And the sad truth is, they have deep reserves. <laughs> As one winged fiend multiplies by 20, Jack. And soon you're like Kahulin, swinging at the sea as wave on wave keeps coming on you. And you know that in the end, you cannot win, though you win this day. Lord, be there when they swarm above me. Be there then, my friend. And then the final, a short poem, uh, which I wrote last year at Pentecost. Easter Pentecost, just something happened. There was a space, an open, a space open for me. It's called What Happened Then? Do we understand what happened then? The few of us in that shuttered room, lamps dimmed, afraid of what would happen when they found us? The women back this morning to tell Peter what they'd seen. Then these two back from Emmaus. And now here he was, here in the room with us. Strange meeting this, the holes there in his hands and feet and heart. And who could have guessed a calm like this could touch us? But that was what we felt. The deep relief you feel when the one you've searched for in a crowd appears and your unbelieving eyes dissolve in tears. For this is what love looks like, and is, and what it does. Peace was what he said, as a peace like no other pierced the gloom and descended on the room. Thank you. Really wonderful and such a privilege. And now it's time to hear from our winners of the 2019 New York Encounter Poetry Contest. The theme is something to start from. And so um, the poets were asked to write on this theme, and Paul is our guest judge, and he will call the winners forward. Third place, a winner is Sydney Doyle for her poem, uh, Reentry. Sydney? lighter in space. And the first line quotes the astronaut directly, Chris Hadfield himself. Re-entry. Five months in space, maneuvering refrigerators with fingertips, 
somersaulting like Superman with a simple tuck and turn, left Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield speechless, dumbstruck upon his return to Earth, unable to describe the divine magnitude of just a section of world visible from a porthole on the International Space Station, forced to imagine the whole heft of it all, stretch by stretch, soaring through the southern lights over Australia, the whirling green glow careening beneath him, the dense light spiderwebbing between cities in Japan, panning over the glaze of smog concealing China, and this sudden sense of us, of all relatedness. How do you develop a perspective gained only from this kind of distance? But beyond all that, what hindered him was simply the weight of it. The heaviness of lips and mouth again, not realizing he learned to talk with a weightless tongue, almost like speaking tongueless. The closest anyone has ever been to leaving the body and being born back into it upon his return to Earth. Head first, thrust from silence to sound, the sudden existence of ground, matter underfoot, the reemergence of north and south, up and down, his weight rising into him like a tide. Isn't this how we all come in? Birthed onto earth, a human made from a bodiless god, and given a tongue that doesn't remember? Thank you. Each being moves in being's own direction. 
as does my heart. My blood makes no sound, flows through each vein, waters all my bones, does its gentle work without a sound. The flies like my skin, it tastes of salt. I walk along the shore, collect the stones that look like heaven. It is, a, it is, is it a fault that I find in all directions the leavings of a long lost perfection? But then this heart, it is its fault. It loves too much. Seaweed, fish bones, hooks and lines and nets, sweet and salt. I pull back my arm and throw the stones back into the never quiet sound, back into the never quiet. Some are sharp pointed, some are round as the earth from which they've come. Perfection comes in every shape, moves by indirection. My heart knows its true old salt. She tells her story to my bones who prop me up, move me around. We navigate the world without fault. Leap from paving stone to paving stone. Even when I fall, they rise up, sound, ready to receive a new direction. Step forth in their astonishing perfection. The heart, they say, can become a stone. And if it did, where would lie the fault? The world is pure music. God's trombones play their tunes, make a mighty sound. Can beauty transgress, make its assault on our weakest selves, flesh and bones, wake us from our sleep, bring us around to this place we occupy. Imperfection sometimes moves us in the right direction. But oh, this heart, but oh, these bones, Oh, the sweetness, and oh, the salt. It is not my fault. It is not my fault. I'll trade these eyes for polished stones. I'll map the wide world from round to round. I'll loose my voice so the sound resounds. Look for me in every blue direction. Listen. That's the sound of perfection. <laughs> Of mistletoe, 
for the hazels dangling catkins, for the dandelion's nectar, for the kingfisher's blue flash, for the cowslip's common hour, for the clearings marked by ash, for the brittle skin of the beech tree, for the empty miles of pasture, for the steep ascent of ivy, for the silence of the future, renewal. In the quiet of the hazel, in the blazing of the bluebell, in the acorn's buried secret, in the fossil print of a fern, in the shedding of the adder, in the splashing of the otter, in the calm sleep of the cygnet, in the smooth skin of the newt, in the long stride of the heron, in the hazel's wealth of catkins, in the shelter of the willow, in the clasp of mistletoe, in the cowslip's golden hour in its cluster and its nectar, in the kingfisher's brief flash over clearings, over ash, in the vellum of the beech tree, in the timeless arc of ivy, in the burgeoning of pasture, in the promise of the future. Thank you.